Tonight, the jury now seated in the historic trial of Hunter Biden on federal gun charges. Hunter Biden, now the first child of a sitting president to be criminally tried. First Lady Jill Biden making a surprise appearance in court. And Joe Biden's emotional message of support for his son. Plus, the potential witnesses. Could his brother Bo's widow be called to the stand? All this just four days after his father's 2024 rival, Donald Trump, was convicted on all 34 counts in his hush money trial. The new comments from Mr. Trump slamming his sentencing date. Also tonight, NBC News learning President Biden plans to sign a sweeping executive action on the border. What it would give him the power to do? Wildfires burning thousands of acres in California with a dangerous heat wave on the way. Dr. Anthony Fauci grilled on Capitol Hill by Republicans on the origin of COVID. The moment he choked up, describing death threats against his family and tensions erupting. Marjorie Taylor Greene refusing to call him a doctor. Four more Israeli hostages confirmed dead as President Biden turns up the pressure on Israel for a ceasefire deal, saying, quote, the deal must get done. And after decades of decline, what's driving the Motor City's big comeback? This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening and welcome. Days after the first criminal conviction of a former president, another first is unfolding tonight in Delaware, where Hunter Biden has become the first offspring of a sitting president to face criminal charges. The trial began today for the president's son, who stands accused of three federal counts related to gun possession. Hunter Biden has pleaded not guilty. Today was jury selection with lawyers questioning dozens of prospective jurors before seating a panel late today. And in the courtroom for most of the day, First Lady Jill Biden in a statement, the president avoiding direct comment on the case, but affirming the first couple's support for their son, saying we are so proud of the man he is today. Ryan Nobles is covering the trial. Tonight, for the first time in American history, the child of a sitting president is facing a criminal trial. And now the 12 member jury is set. Six men and six women, including six jurors who own guns themselves or have family members that purchased them recently. Hunter Biden accused of lying on a federal form in 2018 to purchase a gun, checking a box saying he was not an active drug user, despite acknowledging in his book he was addicted to crack cocaine at the time. First Lady Jill Biden making a surprise appearance, sitting just a few feet behind her son in court. And the president offering his support, saying, as the president, I don't and won't comment on pending federal cases, but as a dad, I have boundless love for my son. President Biden spending Memorial Day weekend with Hunter and recently inviting him to state dinners and defending him publicly. First of all, my son's done nothing wrong. I trust him. I have faith in him. But his son's legal battles likely to take a political toll on the president in the midst of a re-election campaign. Hunter's original plea bargain, which would have resulted in no prison time, was blasted by Republicans as a sweetheart deal, and it fell apart under a judge's scrutiny. Special Prosecutor David Weiss then charging him for both tax and gun crimes, to which Hunter Biden has pleaded not guilty. Weiss saying he'll rely on Hunter's laptop, writing the defendant's laptop is real, it will be introduced as a trial exhibit, and it contains significant evidence of the defendant's guilt. Prosecutors also expected to call Hallie Biden, who Hunter was dating when the handgun was discovered. She's the widow of his brother, Bo. And Ryan, we understand this trial is not expected to last long. That's right, Lester. We expect this trial to last about a week or maybe a little bit longer with opening statements set to begin tomorrow morning. We don't know yet if Hunter Biden will testify in this case, but if convicted, he is facing jail time. Lester. All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you. Also tonight, former President Trump slamming his sentencing date set by a judge for just days before the Republican convention as the Biden campaign accused him of calling for violence if he is sentenced to jail. Here's Gabe Gutierrez. Tonight, former President Trump is blasting his sentencing date in July, just days before the Republican National Convention. 
Well, that's part of the game. And saying he was initially surprised by last week's guilty verdict. Well, it was weird because we go in and the judge, it, it looked like it was a hung jury for a while. The new comments out today as the former president has seen a flood of campaign donations following his conviction on 34 counts of falsifying business records related to hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. He now says he plans to appeal, posting the Supreme Court must decide. He was also asked about revenge. Revenge will be success, and I mean that. But it's awfully hard when you see what they've done. And the potential for prison time. I'm okay with it. He could get probation or up to four years behind bars, though that's unlikely. I'm not sure the public would stand for it. I think it would be tough for the public to take. You know, at a certain point, there's a breaking point. The Biden campaign is seizing on that, accusing Mr. Trump of teeing up political violence and now escalating its attacks, branding the former president a diminished man, white-collar crook, and convicted felon. And we're going to remind people who Donald Trump is. But most Republicans are rallying around him. A new poll shows just one in ten say they're less likely to vote for him after his conviction. And, Gabe, a big question is how lasting the impact of this verdict will be on the race. Yes, Lester, the Trump campaign is arguing it is having a big short-term impact. The campaign says it and the RNC raised $141 million in May, a large chunk of that after the conviction. Though overall, the Biden campaign has been ahead in fundraising. Lester. All right, Gabe, thank you. Facing high numbers of migrants crossing the border, NBC News has learned President Biden is expected to take executive action tomorrow, right in the heels of Mexico's historic presidential election. Telemundo's Julio Vercaro is in Mexico City. Facing mounting pressure over his handling of the border, NBC News has learned that the Biden administration is expected to announce a sweeping executive action that would allow the president to temporarily shut down the border. If the number of illegal crossing reaches 2,500 a day, according to three people familiar to the discussions. There are currently more than 4,000 illegal border crossings every day, according to Homeland Security, suggesting a shutdown could go into effect immediately. This policy is a reversal from the president's stance in January. All I can do. With the presidential election approaching, Mr. Trump routinely slams President Biden over his handling of the border. They're pouring through every state. Every state is now a border state. Now, President Biden is trying to institute restrictions similar to those Mr. Trump tried to enact in 2018, which courts struck down. This really what sounds like a draconian and potentially unlawful immigration shutdown of the border. This announcement on the heels of history in Mexico. Claudia Sheinbaum won yesterday's presidential election, becoming the first woman and the first Jewish president in the country's 200-year history. The climate scientist and former mayor of Mexico City will now be tasked with working with the U.S. to contain the flow of migrants at the border. I'm sure we're not going to have any major announcements of changes or proposals until it's defined to find out who's the next president of the United States. Today, President Biden spoke with Mexico's president-elect. As for tomorrow's executive action, it is expected to include some exceptions, humanitarian exceptions, including one for unaccompanied children. Lester? Julio Vaquero, thank you. In California, a wind-driven wildfire forced thousands of evacuations and shut down a major highway this weekend. It's an early start to fire season as the first major heat wave begins. Dana Griffin is in Tracy, California. Dana, how serious is the threat? Extremely serious, Lester. Firefighters battling this blaze all weekend, but the risk is not over as a heat wave stretching across much of the southwest threatens to produce additional wildfires. Frightening images of a wind-fueled wildfire in Northern California's San Joaquin County, nearly 60 miles east of San Jose. Families forced to evacuate under heavy smoke. And the flame was actually lapping up on the side of the trailers and on the side of my car. This house, the only one to go up in flames, now a charred reminder of what once stood. The corral fire, driven by 40 mile per hour winds, started Saturday afternoon near the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Two firefighters were injured as more than 14,000 acres burned. The cause unknown. This week marks the first significant West Coast heat wave of the year. Coming off the hills of a wet winter, there's a lot more vegetation to burn. 
Heat alerts are in effect for 23 million people across the Southwest, including California, Nevada, Arizona, and Texas. Temperatures expected to soar 20 degrees above average. This could be a heat wave that lasts for uh, 10 days or longer. And so the uh, impacts of a heat wave this significant this early are probably greater than they would be, say, if we saw the same temperatures in July or August. A vastly different weather pattern taking shape in the Pacific Northwest. A pair of atmospheric rivers dumping heavy rain in Washington, causing multiple collisions and snarling traffic during the morning commute. From heavy rain to wildfires, just the beginning of a wacky week of West Coast weather. Dana Griffin, NBC News, Tracy, California. And we are also tracking severe storms tonight across the middle of the country. 16 million people in the risk zone from southern plains and lower Mississippi Valley to parts of the Midwest. Cities that could see impacts include Dallas, Fort Worth, Oklahoma City, Shreveport, and Little Rock. Now to the combative day on Capitol Hill. Dr. Anthony Fauci hitting back at Republican attacks over his handling of COVID in his first public testimony since leaving the government in 2022. Ali Vitali takes us inside the tense hearing room. Tonight, Dr. Anthony Fauci in the hot seat. You belong in prison. I am so sorry that you are subjected to those level of attacks. House Republicans pressing the former face of America's pandemic response on past COVID restrictions, including that rule Americans should stay six feet apart. Wearing a mask, maintaining six feet of distance. Fauci told the committee behind closed doors that six foot rule sort of just appeared. Today, clarifying he meant there were no clinical trials done. Do you think that a role that sort of just appeared is substantial justification for the regulations that we saw based on that six foot rule? When saying it just appeared, it came from the CDC and you didn't feel an obligation as the lead scientist at the NIH to challenge that. I've challenged the CDC multiple times. Publicly, you challenged them on the six foot distance it, rule. It is not appropriate to be publicly challenging a sister organization. Republicans also pressing him on COVID's origins. Fauci denying he downplayed the possibility of a leak from the Wuhan lab in China. Do you agree that there was a push to downplay the lab leak theory? Not on my part. Really? Really? Wow. Wow. I think, I think most of the country would find that, find that amazing. But look at the facts. I've kept an open mind throughout the entire process. Fauci emotional talking about the threats he and his family still face. It is very troublesome to me. Um, it is much more troublesome because they've involved my wife and my three daughters. That hearing underscoring time hasn't healed those political wounds. Meanwhile, former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo set to testify next week. Lester. Ali Vitali, thank you. To the Middle East now, Israel confirming today the deaths of four more hostages in Hamas captivity. It comes as President Biden turns up the pressure on Israel and Hamas to accept a ceasefire deal saying it must get done. Raf Sanchez is in Tel Aviv. Tonight, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying President Biden last week gave an incomplete description of an Israeli offer for a ceasefire in Gaza. It's time for this war to end. Netanyahu under pressure from Israel's far right saying it's incorrect that Israel agreed to a permanent ceasefire without the complete destruction of Hamas and release of all hostages first. Though the White House pushing back, insisting the president fairly and honestly describes the Israeli proposal. And families of the hostages clamoring for an immediate deal. A call growing louder tonight after the Israeli military confirmed the deaths of four more hostages in Hamas captivity. Today, we met the parents of American hostage Hirsch Goldberg Polin. What is your message to the leaders of Israel, to the leaders of Hamas? I would beg the leaders to act like leaders. And part of being a leader is you put your people ahead of your own personal self-interest. While in Gaza, the father of 10-year-old Ahmed wipes his face and tries to keep the flies away. The little boy has cerebral palsy and needs surgery he can't get in the strip. Little his family can do except pray for a ceasefire. President Biden tonight also demanding Hamas accept the deal and writing, this deal must get done. Lester. All right, Raf, thank you. In 60 seconds, the new warnings about alleged Russian attempts to disrupt the Summer Olympics in Paris, how security experts say it could happen right after this. 
Less than two months before the start of the Paris Olympics, troubling new reports tonight about Russia's alleged attempts to disrupt the games with disinformation and cyber attacks. Keir Simmons is in Paris and has the latest. Tonight, with Paris gearing up for this summer's Olympics, two reports warn of Russian disinformation targeting the games, including fake videos aimed at spreading fear of violence and damaging the reputation of the Olympics, produced, a Microsoft report says, by prolific Russian influence actors. This bogus documentary, posted last summer, titled Olympics Has Fallen, featured a deep fake Tom Cruise, while a second report, published tomorrow by US cyber experts Recorded Futures, seen by NBC News, says Russia is the most likely primary state actor to target the Olympics with a disruptive cyber attack. President Putin furious with France for its support of President Zelensky, and Putin angry at the IOC for banning athletes from competing under the Russian flag because of the war. The Olympics is just a, a, a great target if you are Russia. Russia has a long-standing beef with the IOC over the expulsion of Russian athletes uh, for cheating. Paris has invested billions to beef up security, facing challenges, one of the reports says, not seen since London 2012, from protests to cyber attacks. Warning cyber criminals will be attracted to such high-profile events and the chance to target the public with email phishing scams and suspicious links. Now, these are things that we all should be aware of and, and um, you know, hopefully we can all enjoy a fantastic uh, Paris games uh, free, from, uh, free from cyber threats. Tomorrow, here in Paris, experts, including from the US, will gather for an annual cyber summit, predicting a spectacular games and a wave of cyber attacks. Lester. All right, Kier, thank you. And up next for us tonight, the stunning comeback of a city long in decline, how a landmark was transformed for a new Detroit. Finally, a new chapter in the comeback of a great American city. It's happening in Detroit, thanks in part to an old train station and new technology. Jesse Kirsch explains. In the heart of Detroit, the once bustling Michigan Central train station sat abandoned for decades. What is this building a symbol of in this city? Well, in many ways, it's our Ellis Island, uh, because um, when this area, uh, area was in its heyday, um, people were flooding to Detroit. Then came years of decline. Bill Ford Jr. says Michigan Central symbolized that too. But now Detroit is changing again. The city announcing its first population increase in over 60 years. And later this week, following years of renovation, the Ford Motor Company reopens Michigan Central. The kickoff concert live streaming on NBC Universal's Peacock as Detroit celebrates a train station transformed into the heart of a mobility innovation campus. How does that make good business sense for your company specifically? Well, it, it's, it, we're in a war for talent. It becomes, you know, much easier. I think when we have a place like this, when you can say to people, and this is where you'll be working. All of this as electric vehicle development supercharges Detroit's tech scene. The new campus already home to startups like all electric ATV maker Livac. Founder David Medina Alvarez says other states offered better access to investors, but he chose Detroit. Well, we don't have in budget or cash wise, we're having a on surplus with the freedom. And for Detroit native Tierra Fullalove, Michigan Central has meant training for a new career in EV charging. What is it like to see a space like this in Motor City? Um, I think it's, it's great. It's good for our community. Um, it gives opportunities. With hopes that Motor City can once again drive change. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News, Detroit. And that is Nightly News. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.